As I make this video, we're less than two weeks away from Apple unveiling iOS 19 at WWDC. And while that's exciting, the truth is there are still loads of tips and settings already available in iOS that most people don't know about. Things that can genuinely make your iPhone experience a lot better right now. So in this video, I'm going to share 10 of them with you. Okay, let's get into it. Something I'm seeing more and more on websites these days is the use of full screen pop-ups. These are exactly what they sound like. They take over your entire screen while you're browsing, usually to try and get you to sign up to a newsletter in order to keep reading the content that's hidden behind them. And they're annoying because they often don't have any kind of close button. You're left with two options, leave the website or hand over your email address. But Safari on your iPhone has a feature that can help. Next time you run into one of these full screen pop-ups, tap so that you can view the address bar and look for the website options button. Tap into this and choose hide distracting items. From here, you can tap on anything visible on the page, like the pop-up itself, and choose to hide it from view. Press done and you'll be returned to the page, hopefully now with the pop-up gone and your content visible. It might not work every time and it definitely won't get you past paywalls, but in cases where a website is just trying to grab your email, it's a really handy feature to know about. In iOS 18, Apple quietly added a feature that gives you much more control over which apps your iPhone uses by default. It didn't get a lot of attention, but it's genuinely one of the more useful additions if you know where to find it. Head into settings, scroll right down to the bottom and tap on apps. Right at the top of the next screen, you'll see an option called default apps. Tap into this and you can start working your way through the list to change any of the available defaults. So for example, if you don't use Apple Mail and you'd rather use something like Gmail or Spark, you can set that here. You can also change your default browser. Just tap into the browser app section and choose your preferred one. You can even switch your default method of making phone calls. If you regularly use WhatsApp, for example, you can make that your primary calling method instead of the default phone app. There's also the option to set your preferred password manager if you don't want to use the built-in passwords app. And the same goes for translation apps too. By the way, if you enjoy iPhone tips videos like this, but you find it hard to remember everything, you should definitely check out my dedicated iPhone training product, iPhone Essentials Plus. It's a full training portal with more than 150 lessons and new content being added all the time. And each lesson comes with a short video, a step-by-step -step guide, and a downloadable PDF. Just scan the QR code that you can see on screen or click the link in the description to check it out. I reckon the comment that I've had more than any other over the past year is from people saying how much they dislike the redesigned Photos app in iOS 18. And I get it. It's a massive change from how things used to look, and it's definitely not to everyone's taste. But what a lot of people don't realize is that there is one simple change that you can make that massively improves the experience. Just open the Photos app, scroll right down to the bottom and tap on Customize and Reorder. From here, you can untick anything that you're not interested in using the boxes on the left and then drag and reorder the rest so that the things you do care about appear near the top. It might not sound like a huge deal, but clearing out the stuff that you never use and putting your most used sections front and center makes it so much easier to find what you need. It genuinely transforms how usable the Photos app feels. I already mentioned this one in a previous video, but it got a lot of comments from people saying that they hadn't thought of it before and found it really helpful. So I'm including it here as well so the more people can see it. By default, in your control center, anything that you add usually appears as a small circular icon. The idea is that over time, you'll just get used to what all of the icons mean. But if you look at my control center, you'll see that some of these icons look really similar. The timer and stopwatch, for example, are pretty much identical. Voice memos and voice mode on ChatGPT, again, basically the same icon. It can be really easy to forget which is which. So what I do instead is convert all of my icons into one by two horizontal tiles. That way you still get the icon, but also the name of the action underneath it. To do that, just long press anywhere in control center to enter edit mode. Then on any of the circular icons, grab the little drag bar at the bottom, pull down slightly and then drag to the right. That will change it to a horizontal tile. Yes, this does mean that you'll fit fewer tiles per page, but considering you can create additional pages in control center, I don't really think that's a problem. You can still get eight or nine of your most used actions on the main page without any issues. Here's a smart iPhone tip for you, especially if you're traveling this summer, install a VPN. It's one of the easiest ways to protect your personal data when connecting to unfamiliar Wi-Fi. You know, the type that you get in airports, hotels, coffee shops, 
And for that, I recommend Private Internet Access, who are sponsoring today's video. A VPN like PIA encrypts your traffic, hides your IP address, and makes your browsing totally private. In fact, using the internet without a VPN like PIA is like leaving your phone out on a table at a cafe. It might be fine, but all it takes is one bad person to ruin your day. But with private internet access, it's like zipping it away in a secure inner pocket. Totally protected, totally invisible. And here's something else that I love about PIA. Region unlocks, streaming libraries, live sports, even local deals often change depending on where you are. With servers in 91 countries, PIA lets you spoof your location and access the content that you're used to wherever you are. It works across all platforms and protects unlimited devices and their no logs policy has even been proven in court. Right now, use my link piavpn.com slash PHT and you can get 86% off plus four months free. There's even a 30 day money back guarantee. Check out the link in the description or the QR code to get started. If you own an iPhone 16 or 16 Pro, or if you end up picking up one of the iPhone 17 models later this year, which I'm sure will also have this feature, you've already encountered what I think is one of the worst hardware decisions Apple has made recently, the camera control button. It's that little button down on the bottom right side of your phone. In theory, this is a good idea. The whole point is that it becomes a dedicated shutter button. And when you're holding the phone out in front of you like you're about to take a photo, it sits exactly where you'd expect a shutter button to be. By default, pressing that button doesn't just act as a shutter, it launches the camera app. And I can't tell you how many times I've accidentally triggered the camera, especially when grabbing my phone from a MagSafe charger or just picking it up firmly from the bottom. Thankfully, there is a setting that you can change that allows you to keep the useful shutter functionality while getting rid of the accidental launches. Go into settings, then choose camera. And at the top of this screen, tap on camera control. The setting that you're looking for is launch camera. By default, this is set to single click. I would recommend changing this to double click. That way you can still use the button to launch your camera if you want, but you'll need to deliberately double press it, which makes it much harder to trigger by accident. Just below that, there's also an option called require screen on. Make sure that this is enabled. That means that the camera app will only launch if your iPhone screen is already on giving you even more control. And one more thing to mention, when you tap into launch camera, the default is set to launch the camera app, but you can change this to something else if you prefer. You could set it to launch Instagram or the code scanner or the magnifier, which can be a really helpful accessibility tool. Or if you find that you don't want the button to launch anything at all, you can change it to none. That way the button still works as a shutter, but it won't ever accidentally launch any apps. I personally hate getting voicemails, you have to go through all the hassle of setting up your voicemail account with your phone provider. Then you've got to find somewhere quiet to actually listen to the message. And if someone's left you a phone number to call them back, you've got to jot it down before it disappears. Everything about voicemail just feels like old tech to me. Thankfully, your iPhone has a much more up-to-date feature called Live Voicemail. As long as your phone is running iOS 17 and Live Voicemail is supported in your language and region, your phone can transcribe voicemails in real time as they're coming through. So instead of listening to the message, you can simply read a transcription of what the person is saying. That way, you'll instantly know whether it's something you can ignore or if you need to call them back. And if you do, the phone number or any details that you need will already be right there in front of you. To enable it, go into settings, scroll to the bottom and tap into apps, then choose phone. Scroll down on this page and you should see an option called live voicemail. Tap into this and toggle it on. Once it's set up, just go to the phone app, tap on voicemail in the bottom right, and you'll see any voicemails that have come through. Tap into one to either play it back or simply read the transcription. If you're enjoying the content here, why not sign up for my weekly newsletter, which is all about tech news and tips delivered free to your inbox each Friday. Sign up via the QR code on screen or the link in the description. Something I'm always surprised by is just how many iPhone owners have no idea about the amount of data that their iPhone is capturing in the background about how they use their device and then passing that data over to Apple. In fairness, Apple does say that this data is collected anonymously, but it's still your data and you're not really getting anything in return. You could even argue that there is a downside to this beyond privacy, which is that it consumes battery to collect and send this information. To check this, go into settings and choose privacy and security. Scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page and tap into analytics and improvements. Anything that you see enabled in here means you've given consent for your device to capture that particular kind of data and send it to Apple. 
It includes things like sharing iPhone and watch analytics, helping Apple improve Siri and dictation, improving Fitness Plus, contributing to Apple Pay improvements, and enhancing AI location accuracy. Personally, I would recommend switching all of these off. Your iPhone tracks your location, and while that's often a really useful thing, like when you're using Uber or getting food delivered, it's worth knowing just how much of your location data your apps are actually getting. Because by default, I think a lot of apps on your phone are given access to more location information than they really need. There are two types of location access, general and precise. General location gives the app an idea of where you are, but not your exact spot. Precise location, on the other hand, does exactly what it sounds like. It tells the app your exact location. The key here is deciding which apps really need that level of access. So to manage this, go into settings, scroll down and tap privacy and security. Then go into location services. I wouldn't recommend switching location services off completely because there are lots of situations where it is genuinely helpful. But what I would recommend is going through the list of apps here and checking what kind of access each one has. When you tap on an app, you'll see options like never, ask next time or when I share, and while using the app. And in some cases, you might also see an option for always, which means the app has access to your location even when it isn't open, and that is one to be especially cautious with. Beneath those options, you'll also see a toggle for precise location. This is where you get to decide whether that app can pinpoint your exact location or just know roughly where you are. For something like Uber Eats or Deliveroo, it makes sense to leave this on. But for something like Instagram, there isn't really any benefit to giving it that kind of access, so I would personally toggle it off. Take a few minutes to work through this list and make an app-by-app -app decision. I think you'll be surprised just how many apps are tracking your exact location without you even realizing it. If you ever need to hand your phone over to someone, but you want to make sure they can't exit the app that you've opened, there's a feature you should know about. It's called Guided Access. It's been around for a while, but it's the best way to lock your iPhone to a single app. To enable it, go into Settings, then tap on Accessibility. Scroll right to the bottom and choose Guided Access under the General section. Toggle Guided Access on, then go into Passcode Settings and set a passcode for it. You'll be asked to input a new passcode and this will be used to exit Guided Access. You'll also see the option to enable Face ID or Touch ID. I used to recommend switching this on, I now recommend switching it off. There have been situations especially involving border control or law enforcement, where someone may be compelled to unlock their phone using biometrics and a passcode provides an added layer of protection since you can't legally be forced to give that over in many places. Once you've set your passcode, come out of settings and open the app that you want the person to be able to use. Then triple press the side button. This will bring up your accessibility shortcuts and guided access will be one of the options. Tap start in the upper right corner. Now the app that you're in will be fully functional, but the person using your phone won't be able to exit the app or access anything else on your device. To exit guided access, triple press the side button again, enter your passcode, and then tap end in the top left corner. It's a really handy feature for all kinds of scenarios, especially if you're handing your phone to a kid to play a game or watch a video. When you take a photo on your iPhone, your phone also captures metadata. This includes details like the time, date, camera settings, and crucially, the location where the photo was taken. It's useful for organizing and finding your photos later, especially if you like exploring your images by location, but it does raise a privacy concern when it comes to sharing. By default, your iPhone includes this metadata when you send someone a photo. That means that anyone that you share it with can potentially see exactly where that photo was taken. And unfortunately, there is no way to turn this off across the board. You have to make a decision every time that you share a photo. So when you're in the Photos app and you tap on a photo, then press the Share button in the bottom left corner, look up at the top of the Share sheet. You'll see a message letting you know that location is included. This is your heads up that the recipient will be able to view the exact location where the photo was taken. If you want to prevent that, just tap the Options button. At the top of the screen, you'll see a location toggle. Turn it off, press Done, and then send the image as normal. That way, the recipient gets the photo, but without any of the location data attached. Your copy still keeps all of the metadata. It's only stripped out from the shared version. So that was 10 tips and settings to help make your iPhone experience better. How many did you already know? And is there anything you think I should have included? If there's something you're hoping to see in iOS 19 when it's announced in a couple of weeks, drop me a comment and let me know. And as ever, if you found this video useful, do please consider leaving me a like and subscribing to the channel for more content like this in the future. 
See you on the next video. And finally, thanks again to Private Internet Access for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description for 86% off plus four months extra free.